Hello and, and good afternoon. My name is uh, Manos Brilakis from uh, VA North Texas Healthcare System and the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. And uh, today is our 17th uh, complex coronary interventions webcast, a webcast that we've been doing uh, with the support of Terumo as well as Abbott Vascular for the last uh, three and a half years, um, reviewing several complex interventional cases and uh, the latest trends um, and the developments in the field. Today, it was supposed to be given actually by Dr. Dimitri Karbaliotis from CRF. However, he just called me a few minutes ago. He did have an emergency call, so uh, he is not able to join us on time. He'll try to make it a little later on. But in the meantime, we're going to share some other cases that were used as backup uh, until he's able to join us. So starting off uh, with the first case, a case recently done in our lab, trying to demonstrate uh, how to resolve proximal cap ambiguity. So this is the diagnostic angiogram. The patient uh, presented with significant exertional dyspnea, and he was found to have anterior ischemia on uh, nuclear stress testing. Left main injection shows circumflex without much disease. However, there is an occlusion in the proximal LAD, which is actually very close to the origin of a fairly large uh, first uh, diagonal branch. And this is the picture from the right coronary artery. And uh, there is um, not really any visualization of where the left uh, anterior descending artery is. So here we have a situation in which uh, we do know we have ischemia. The patient does have significant symptoms, however, we do not seem to find where the target vessel is. What can we do next? And uh, feel free to enter notes and text uh, into your um, into your um, um, WebEx uh, screen. You can actually uh, transmit comments on or any questions. So the first question is to understand where is the LAD and if there is an LAD. And there are rare occasions in which uh, the target vessel is actually absent or uh, it's so diffusely diseased you can barely see it. However, in this particular case, it seems a little unlikely that we wouldn't see anything in the LAD distribution if, um, if there were something there. One option to resolve this problem is to actually do a dual injection and then see if something is filling. The other option is to do a computed tomography a CTA, a coronary CTA, which sometimes can uh, demonstrate that there's filling in the vessel and where the filling is coming from. However, another possibility is that there is another branch coming off from another vessel or a branch of an anomalous origin that actually comes and supplies this coronary artery. And what we have here is uh, a proximal acute marginal branch that takes off, and that we saw this a little better once we moved our catheter back towards the ostium of the right coronary, and we now see this vessel that is taking off from the proximal right, and has a very tortuous course, and now there is the LAD that we were unable to see so far doing the other injection. So here is the LAD, fairly large size vessel. And this demonstrates the importance of doing, um, um, of doing dual injections and uh, of being um, cognizant of the possibility that another vessel may be there that we may not necessarily see uh, just by doing our standard injections. So very, very common proximal right coronary artery. And then uh, with the proximal right coronary artery, you may have another branch or sometimes comes off at a completely different origin and then supplies the CTO target vessel. And this is the view with the dual injection. We did this injection using a six French uh, IM guide into the proximal right coronary artery, as well as an EBU 375 guide into the LAD for undergrade crossing. And we did use a six French guide instead of our standard eight French, as is the one on the left main, because we thought that the chance of performing retrograde recanalization would be very, very low here, given that this is a very tortuous collateral, and also it is the single collateral going to this territory. So if we were to go through it, there is a significant chance that we might actually 
have ischemia and um, the patient might become unstable, might have angina, or have some hemodynamic instability. So there, is, um, um, there are many reasons why six friends should be just fine in this particular case, although our standard setup is to use uh, two eight friends guides that are 45 um, um, centim with the seeds that are 45 centimeters long, reaching all the way to the diaphragm, as you can see in this particular case. So we do have um, a big guide in the anterior, and then we have a smaller guide in the retrograde um, coronary vessel. And this is another dual injection. The challenge here remains, although now we can see a little better that there is a vessel, there is the LAD, it's still hard to understand where exactly the LAD is originating in relationship to the diagonal branch. So we have this takeoff of the diagonal and probably the takeoff of the occluded LAD somewhere in the same area, but it's very, very hard to, um, to see it in this particular view. So we did different, um, different views and still we were not 100% convinced that we understood exactly where the vessel was taking off. And then we finally decided to draw the microcatheter and try to enter or try to cross in the area we thought might be the proximal cow. Clearly we were wrong many times, as you can see in this particular case. This is the wire on the top that goes into the diagonal branch. And then the wire on the bottom is actually a Gaia wire. We used both Gaia second and Gaia third wires. And as you can see, although initially it appears that it might actually be coursing in the vessel, with the vessel movement, you can see clearly that the wire is actually outside. And some people get sometimes very concerned when they see this wire being outside the vessel. However, this is not exactly the reason for major concern because if the wire only goes out, so if we don't follow up with our microcatheter, which is sitting back here in the left main, usually the exit point is very, very small and there's no bleeding, or even if it is, it's very easy to control. However, if we do this, if we advance the wire and the wire goes out and then microcatheter or balloon follows the wire, then we do have a much larger exit point that is significantly harder to treat as compared with uh, just having a guide wire exit point. So clearly here, that's not the place we'd like to be. So we tried for a while and we were unsuccessful getting the wire to track the LAD. And then finally, we were able to create a small dissection plane through which the Gaia wire actually uh, looped and advanced a little bit. And in this view, which is the caudal view, this looks promising because the knuckle or the loop is actually moving in sync with the LAD. So these are good news. But we obviously have to confirm it, so we took an orthogonal view. And here we also see that the loop, although it's fairly large and fairly generous, which is something we'd like to avoid usually, but nevertheless, the movement is in sync with the movement of the LAD, giving us more reassurance that we're following along the right path. And this wire here is the wire that is into the diagonal branch. Doesn't really feel much now because we are fairly occlusive getting equipment through the stenosis area. So a good start. We were now able to resolve the ambiguity by advancing a loop that went subintimal but is tracking the vessel. And this is an example of the move the cap technique this is a technique in which when we don't understand where the lesion is starting, we create a little dissection proximal to the presumed or known origin of the occlusion. And then by using that, we're able to go subintimal. And then we trust the knuckle or trust the loop to follow the vessel structure rather than exit the vessel and cause a perforation. What is the next step? Again, depends on geography and personal preferences. So in many countries, um, especially in Europe and Asia, the next step is to do perhaps a dual lumen microcatheter and then try to re-enter using various guide wires. Whereas in the US and some parts of the UK, the preferred approach in such cases of subminimal crosses 
is to use the Stingray system, which you can see here, the two little dots, the little markers of the Stingray balloon. And then trying to exit, you see here the exit of the Stingray guide wire in between those two little markers. So once again, we have subintimal Stingray balloon, and we're trying to re-enter by performing a puncture with the Stingray guide wire. One of the things that has bothered some already is that the flow seems to be decreased. So one of the challenges when we do this dissection re-entry is that now we, we kind of compromise flow coming from the collateral branch into the LAD and then continue down the LAD because we have the subintimal plane which kind of limits the undergrade flow. So one of the downsides of this technique is again using losing the good visualization from collateral flow. We did a technique that is called a stick and swap, which means we first perform the puncture using the Gaia, I'm sorry, the Stingray guide wire, and then we took it out. And actually, in this particular case, we tried to use the Gaia second first. And the Gaia second, we've had fairly good luck lately by doing this re-entry because the Gaia second has this composite core construction and is able to track the vessel well, but it didn't work in this particular case. So we went back to the standard swap, which is for a Pilot 200 stiff polymer wire, and then the wire felt good. You see it's exiting between the two markers, and then uh, it went downstream. One of the challenges that we have, as we just mentioned, is that now we've lost the visualization. So how do we know if we're in the true lumen or not? And that can be a challenge. In this particular case, we were fairly confident that we were following the architecture based on our earlier shots. And so after putting, uh, after ballooning with a very small balloon, now we would see that we're actually indeed into the into the vessel and we have um, good outflow. And then after placing two drag eluting stents, we did have um, nice restoration of undergrade flow. We stopped the stents proximal to the bifurcation of this large diagonal and distal LAD. So we did have a nice um, final and geographic result. I think this case is uh, interesting because it highlights several things. The one is how to resolve where the vessel is failing. So before trying to open a CTO, it's very, very important to understand where is the vessel we're trying to get to. And I think one of the lessons from this case is that somehow, sometimes we may have an additional branch coming from the proximal RCA, from the same osteum, or maybe from different ostia from the order that can then provide flow to collaterals in the LAD or even to collaterals in the right coronary artery. Not long ago, we had another case in which there was a large second branch coming off from the proximal right coronary artery, and that branch went all the way down to the PDA, supplying, supplying the vessel very nicely. So something to keep in mind, RCA might have a lot of anatomic variants, and one should be always open to the possibility of having some early origin branches that supply either the contralateral vessel, the LAD at the CERC, or the rack coronary artery. The second lesson is that uh, when we don't understand where the CTO is starting, or in other words, where we have the so-called proximal camp ambiguity, it is important to have a game plan. You have some potential techniques that we can use to understand and resolve that ambiguity. And these techniques are, first and foremost, to several views and try to understand if we have any potential little proximal caps or nubs that lead to the occlusion. And then if it doesn't work, then the move the cap techniques, which is the scratch and go and or the base, balloon assisted subintimal entry, can help us resolve the ambiguity essentially by gaining access to the subintimal space proximal to the occlusion site, and then following the subintimal space with the knuckle to ensure that we're going into the vessel rather than outside into the pericardium. And the third uh, interesting lesson from this particular case is the need for having advanced reentry techniques, and more specifically, doing the stick and swap technique in which we stick with the stiff wire 
Stingray, and Torgaia, and then switch for a different, usually a polymer wire, such as the Pilot 200, to facilitate re-entry into the distal true lumen. And we saw that this worked fairly, fairly well in this uh, particular case. I see some questions that are coming through. Um, one was about uh, the difference between the base and the uh, scratch and go. So I, I didn't actually show you any case of base, but base or balloon assisted subintimal entry, it's a similar thing to this technique, scratch and go. The difference is in base that we actually come to the proximal vessel and instead of advancing a wire to the wall hoping to create a dissection, we actually inflate a slightly oversized balloon into the proximal part of the vessel, aiming to intentionally create some proximal dissection. So we're inflating the balloon, again, slightly oversized, 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters oversized, and then by doing that, we can sometimes create a dissection plane that we can engage with the microcaster and the polymer wire, and then form our nacral and then continue down the vessel path. So both the scratch and go and the base are techniques that can be used to understand where we're starting and resolve the proximal kappa ambiguity. And then uh, there, are, uh, there are no more questions from what I can see. If anyone else has any thoughts or questions, this is a good time. Okay, so if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next presentation. So actually, this was a, a presentation that I recently uh, did in uh, the Great Wall meeting. There was a meeting in Beijing in China, and this has to do about um, advanced uh, dissection and re-entry techniques, how to get back into the main lumen of the vessel after going subintimal, and has many actually common themes with the case we just demonstrated to you. And these are my disclosures. And we'll know that there are different techniques for crossing. There's undergrade wires, there's undergrade dissection and reentry, and there are retrograde techniques. And all of them can be useful. However, the ones that are probably the ones with the most confusion surrounding them are the dissection techniques, which are both in the undergrade direction as well as the retrograde direction. And although it sounds confusing, have all these acronyms there, STAR, LAST, CART, reverse CART, many different things, I think one can simplify them by breaking the section re-entry into the two parts, which is the dissection and the re-entry. And the dissection can be done in both sides by advancing a knuckled wire, which is usually a polymer-coated guide wire. And, the, and in the undergrade approach, actually, the other option is to use the cross boss, which is a blunt tip, one millimeter distal tip microcatheter. Whereas in the retrograde approach, the direction is only the knuckle wire. And now reentry, it's easy on the retrograde because in the vast majority of cases, it's going to happen with what's called reverse card, which is balloon inflated over undergrade wire and retrograde wire entering the space created by the balloon. That's the reverse card. Again, the majority of cases are done like this. In contrast, there are multiple options on the undergrade reentry area. But for them, the two that I would think more about is the STAR and the Stingray. The STAR being the original technique that was pioneered by Antonio Colombo back in 2005, CCI paper, who essentially took a polymer wire and created a loop and pushed the loop all the way down until the loop actually re-enter into the distal true lumen, which happens, but happens very, very distally. And the issue with that is that we have then a lot, a lot of um, lost side branches. We need a very, very long segment of stent. And as a result, restenosis is very high and reocclusion is very high with more than 50% rates at one year. So definitely STAR, although it's a very incredibly pioneering technique and it's been, it's from the basis of what we currently do, it is not really a technique we want to use on a day-to-day -day basis because, again, you're going to lose all those branches, which are important, and also because the restenosis rates and reocclusion rates are going to be very, very high. In contrast, what we do is the stingray reentry, which we already 
demonstrated in the first case we showed, and we'll show a few more cases in this particular, in this particular part of the webcast. Once again, this is the crossboss and this is the knuckle wire. Usually a polymer wire is used, and the two more commonly used for this are either the Fielder XT, which is a soft taper tip polymer wire, or the Pilot 200, which is also polymer, but it's not taper tip and it's stiffer. The advantage of, this, of the Fielder XT is it forms very tight knuckles because it's so soft. The advantage of the Pilot 200 is it's a little stiffer, so a little more supportive. And because it forms bigger loops, it is a little less likely to enter into Cybrans. And this is the Stingray design, which has two exit ports. One is facing one surface, the other is facing the other surface. We don't really know which one is facing which surface, and that's a trial and error process. So once the Stingray goes in, and we'll show a cartoon in a second, then it's inflated, it's um, self-orienting, and then we use the Stingray guide wire to find the port that faces into, into the vessel. And this is an example of um, using this equipment for um, undergrade CTO PCI. We start with a standard use of uh, a cross boss for undergrade crossing. The first step is to advance the cross boss over a workhorse guide wire. And then we pull the guide wire back in and spin fast, 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 much faster than what you see over here. We spin very quickly. And in about one in three cases, the cross boss catheter may actually cross from true lumen into true lumen. And then by doing that, then we can re-advance our workhorse guide wire, and now we're across the lesion. However, in the remaining two-thirds, the cross boss does not go true to true. Instead, it crosses subintimally. So here's the same example. We advance the workhorse wire. The cross boss catheter is coming. We do need, when we do this procedure, a good guide support. So amplets left for the right coronary and XB or EBU for the left. And once again, the wire is pulled back in, and we're spinning much, much faster than you see up in the uh, little image. And then by doing that, two-thirds of the times, the catheter is going to track into the subintimal space. And then now we're subintimally next to the distal true lumen. And our next call is to go from the subintimal space back into the distal true lumen and complete our re-entry procedure. The first step is to inflate the Stingray balloon. Low atmospheres, we only inflate it um, up to four atmospheres, not higher than that, because otherwise it's rupture. And then once we inflate it, the balloon is going to self-orient itself. And uh, uh, then um, uh, by doing that, then one surface is going to face up, the other is going to face down. We don't know which one is facing where, so we're going to come now with our Stingray guide wire, which is specially designed with a very, very small um, tip, a 0 0.003 tip here, which is designed to catch the tissue and avoid sliding across the different tissue planes. So that was the first exit port. That was not the one. The second port, it looks good. We advance it, and we're back into the distal true lumen. And these are some other cases illustrating use of this equipment. Here's an example of an instantary stenosis case with the reconstitution of distal bifurcation of the PDA and PLV. So fairly long occlusion. And then here is the cross post catheter. And we do know that the cross post is particularly useful when used in cases with previous coronary stents. The reason is that the stent likely acts as a barrier to prevent the crossbow catheter from getting outside the vessel. So have a very nice location of the crossbow catheter here. You see it's moving inside the previous stents. Looks very good. And then within one minute, actually, we're able to advance most of the stent. We pushed back a miracle three wire, and here we are into the distal true lumen. So crossbow can really, really facilitate crossing of instant stenosis CTOs and allow us to re-enter the distal true lumen with uh, high success uh, rates and high efficiency. And this is the result after we put some more stents within the previously re-stenosed stent. 
there's a lot of um, um, debate about how to best approach um, a CTO, but we do see some convergence. And this slide is from Dr. Etsuo Tsuchikani. He presented it uh, both at the Euro CTO Club and at TCT. And this is the Asian Pacific CTO Club, which starts with careful analysis of the angiogram and specifically recommends use of the cross boss for cases of instant restenosis, which is very similar to the case we just, um, we just discussed. And then it continues on in a very similar way with a hybrid algorithm by going through whether there is proximal cap ambiguity, and then if there is, then IVOS is preferred to clarify it. How is the distal vessel? And if you have ambiguity in the proximal cap and or poor quality distal vessel or distal perforation, then if you can, if you have good collaterals, then the retrograde approach is recommended. And this is, again, very similar to how we approach lesions in the hybrid approach in the U.S. Otherwise, we go undergrade, and if it's a good reentry zone, then they recommend sexual reentry. If it is um, um, more diseased uh, reentry zone, then uh, they recommend parallel wiring and or IVOS guided wire. So there's clearly a lot of similarities, and I think there's becoming worldwide convergence on how to treat CTOs based on the anatomic characteristics of um, every, every occlusion. There's admittedly a little bit of confusion about how and when to use the cross post catheter. And we are recently started a randomized uh, multicenter trial called the cross post first, in which we randomize patients who are referred for undergrade CTO PCI and don't have osteo lesions to either start with a cross post catheter or to start with um, um, wire escalation. And the primary endpoint is the crossing time, because we know in experience centers, success is going to be 90% or more, so it's hard to show a difference in final success. However, efficiency is not as well studied. So the primary endpoint is the crossing time to see if by using an upfront, the cross post catheter, that's going to allow us to be more efficient and cross the CTOs within a shorter period of time. We do have also mason points and several secondary endpoints like uh, procedural success, procedure time, fluoroscopy time, radiation dose, contrast equipment use, et cetera. And uh, there, these are the sites for the study, uh, both in the United States as well as a site in Canada and a couple sites in the United Kingdom. So we're very excited about the study. It again, kicked off last month, and um, um, we are thrilled um, uh, to uh, perform it. We're hoping that we'll get results within a year and we'll keep you posted on um, the things that happen um, during that period of time. Moving on to another case, another right coronary CTO, nice distal vessel, although we have this disease close to bifurcation, and we have a proximal vessel occlusion. Same thing from a different angle. Once again, we have a proximal, uh, proximal occlusion, maybe a little more tapered entry zone, which is favorable. And then we tried to cross with uh, the crossbows and guide wires, but we were unable to. And then the crossbows, one of the challenges sometimes is that it may go into side branches. So in this particular case, it uh, went into several side branches and we were not able to advance the crossbows across the RCA band. So we switched for a knuckle wire. You can see here that's a filter XT, forms a very nice entitled knuckle. And then the knuckle is uh, following up well. And then usually we try to finish with a cross post in the last segment to minimize the dissection plane. And here with the, in, the, in the horizontal part of the distal RCA, this is a favorable spot for re-entry. And this is the stingray balloon once again, trying to get back into the distal true lumen uh, using uh, the stingray balloon and guide wire. The stick looks good. We switch for a pilot 200. And this is the image we got. You can see it seems to be dancing with the vessel, but we also seem to have kind of a dual dual outline of the vessel. There's no perfect alignment between the vessel and the wire. Something may not be quite right. You see in a different cranial view, or your cranial. Uh, the wire seems to be doing okay, but doesn't look perfect. So it's been a little uh, 
confusing. And actually, I must say, we were also debating it, and we were almost ready to put a stent in. But thank God we did not. And I'll show you why after we put the IVUS catheter in. And I love, again, this image because it shows you very nicely how it is performing subintimal CTO-PCI. What we're seeing here is the false lumen that has no layers, and then here's the true lumen up at 10, 11 o'clock, which is essentially compressed because of the subintimal hematoma that has developed. So if we go a little further back, you can see here that um, the distal true lumen being here compressed and then a large false lumen with no layers of the wall. And that's how you recognize it is because you don't really have any layers in contrast to what the wall should be like. So clearly we were not where we were supposed to be. So we took another stingray balloon and uh, did again re-entry. We knew that the first wire was not in the right spot, so we tried to go a slightly different spot. We did uh, stick and swap once again. And this is the IVUS. And now this is very nice because we can see that our wire and IVUS catheter are both located inside the true lumen, whereas the first guide wire is into the false lumen. So by using this uh, stick and swap technique, we were able this time to get in the true lumen, re expand it to some extent, and now um, we control the vessel. The dual injection also help us decide where to start standing. Here is the bifurcation PDA-PLV. We want to end our stand just before the bifurcation there, which seems to be the case in this particular view. And then after the stents are in, have a nice result. We've maintained all our branches. You may make an argument that we still have disease in the PLV. We still have disease in the PDA. And I would definitely agree with you but this is the cases where you'd rather let it uh, grow and recover with time rather than run to stand and put a bunch more stents distally because these vessels do grow quite a bit. The average is 0.4 millimeters, but can be as much as one millimeter. So when you come back in a few months, you may see those vessels completely transformed because of the restoration of undergrade flow. So CrossBoss has many challenges and many solutions. One of the problems is you cannot enter the proximal cap, and sometimes to get the, over this, you stick it using a stiff wire like a Pro-12 or a Gaia third, and then advance the knuckle. This is kind of similar to the move the cap technique we just described in the previous case. Also, another problem is when the cross boss goes into side branches, a particular problem with marginals. And one way to get around this is to create a knuckle wire and the knuckle is used to go around those branches and redirect the cross-boss catheter to the distal vessel. And third, if the cross-boss does not go, then the way around this is to increase the support, have a big amplet guide, or use an extension, or use an anchor wire. Um, essentially, try to increase the support because it is a bulky catheter and it does require good support. How about challenges with reentry? To facilitate it, you want to minimize the dissection, finish the, with the boss is one saying, which means you don't want to get the knuckle all the way down, but you want to do the very, very last portion of crossing subintimally with the cross boss that is small and leaves a small footprint. The other one is to select an optimal reentry spot. Usually the horizontal part of the RCA is pretty good. You have good views for reentry. And then use the stick and swap technique, especially in vessels that are small and diffusely diseased. And this is how the stingray should look ideally. It should look fairly narrow, as a narrow line that is next to the true lumen. And, and it is trying to uh, be on the side rather than being on top of the vessel. So if both balloon lumens are seen, that's not good. That means you're on top of the vessel. If you see a straight line, this is good. That means we're on the side of the vessel, so the wire needs to go to the direction of the vessel. Stick and swap, we discussed about this already, but stick and swap is um, um, 
a technique when you have these digital vessels. Here is the example with uh, making the stick with the stingray wire. Then we remove it, and then we advance a polymer wire to track the vessel and go digital to lumen. And this is an example of this technique. This is the right corner CTO. We had um, a lot of difficulty getting through the first part, but eventually we were able to go all the way down and and go into posterior descending artery. And then we had a hard time visualizing the balloon. So we did what's called the double blind stick and swap. You can see here that the stingray wire is, point, is, is coming out before the proximal marker. And then we pull the wire back and now we're advancing the wire, and now it's going in between the two markers in the opposite direction than it did before. So essentially we created exit points, both sides of the balloon. And by doing that, we were able to then swap for a pile of 200, which um, then found its way and looked promising. Of course, you have to confirm, and this is the example with the um, contralateral injection. You can see a nice landing of the wire and a nice final result. So this is called the double blind stick and swap technique. And this is one way to achieve true lumen reentry. We just published this, um, um, I think it was last month in uh, General of Invasive Cardiology. And it's a technique that is very useful because it minimizes the contrast, it minimizes the x-ray time and the x-ray dose for the patient and the operator, and can facilitate getting back into the distal true lumen. This is the technique we discussed as well, which is the straw technique, also published in JSC recently, which um, describes how advancing an over-the-wire balloon proximal can uh, both uh, block the inflow and at the same time allow aspiration of the blood, decompressing the true lumen. One single, simple way for doing this is actually to just aspirate from the back end of the stingray balloon. And this is again visually how it happens. Got a big hematoma there in the subminimal space. I would advance a balloon over the wire balloon more proximal. Balloon is inflated. The hematoma is aspirated. And then that expands the lumen, and now we have a nice re-entry spot that we can use to get in with our guide wire. What are the outcomes with this? This is from uh, Progress ETO, a multi-center registry that we're running in the U.S. A paper just published showing that uh, in um, 11 centers, more than 1,000 lesions, technical success was 91% with complications of 1.7%. And success was achieved using a variety of techniques. In 43%, the final successful technique was undergrade wire escalation. In 26%, it was undergrade dissection and reentry. And in 31%, it was retrograde. And here it is how often one technique was used, regardless of which one was the final successful, the final successful technique. So the message here is that you need several potential crossing strategies to be able to successfully recanalize the CTO. So you need both undergrade techniques, both retrograde, and you, you need the sexual reentry and pure undergrade. And by doing this and by switching between approaches, then a high final success rate can be achieved. How about uh, EGOS? Usually, obviously, the grade is more commonly used in the beginning, but retrograde in green and undergrade dissection reentry is also commonly used afterwards. And this is an example showing that those techniques can be useful not only for CTO intervention, but also in other situations. This is an example of a patient with the proximal right coronary artery CTO. I'm sorry, proximal right coronary artery lesion as well as a distal lesion. Standard PCI, advanced the wire, ballooned, balloon causal dissection. But then during attempts to deliver a stent, everything came out, resulting in acute vessel closure and ST segment elevation. Couldn't rewire, but eventually we took a pilot 200, where it's a minimal, got a stingray balloon, re entered the true lumen, put in a stent, 
and the case was solved. So now we have restoration of undergrade flow, no complications, and the patient did very, very well. How about the long-term outcomes? And that's a common concern because, as you saw in STAR technique, we have higher occlusion rates. However, there's limited studies for the sexual reentry, but they look encouraging. This is from our center showing that um, in um, up to two, three years, uh, statistically similar, numerically slightly lower patency rate and less TLR um, with um, uh, use of the bridge point system. Similar results were seen from Stefan Rinfre from Quebec City in Canada, now in Montreal, which shows that uh, using undergraded section reentry had fairly similar freedom from death MI, TVR, or the occlusion as compared to use of other techniques. Um, and the one actually predictor of worse long-term patency was treating instant CTOs, which seemed to have much, much higher risk stenosis rates as you would expect. So I think to summarize, we went through a variety of dissection reentry techniques, and we can see that they can really revolutionize CTO PCI, and they're a critical part of the hybrid algorithm. We do avoid using the extensive dissection strategies such as STAR because of high stenosis last year occlusion rates. However, limited dissection is important for high success rates, and we still, of course, need uh, some more uh, uh, follow up studies. So, this is, um, um, I think we're going to stop over here. I think Dr. Kabaliotis um, has not been able to join us um, today. He had again, uh, we apologize, but he did have a long case. Um, there's one question that came through about uh, uh, use of the contrast uh, guided um, uh, STAR, which is a great point. So the contrast guided STAR, or the so-called Carlino technique, named after Mauro Carlino, an Italian interventionist who developed it, it's a variation of the STAR technique in which instead of using a loop, one takes a microcatheter and a small syringe and ejects a small amount of contrast through the microcatheter, trying to kind of find its way through the occlusion. And that technique, using a small amount of contrast, is actually becoming fairly useful, for example, in balloon uncrossable cases or when there's ambiguity. And it's a good thing to have in our armamentarium, especially for advanced operators. It's not something we do with big volumes of contrast because that can have more risk and create more extensive dissection. So the limited contrast star or the limited Carlino technique has emerged as a nice nice technical uh, tip and trick essentially to facilitate complex CTO PCI. So I'm going to stop over here. I would like to thank again our sponsors, Terumo, as well as Abbott Vascular for sponsoring the webcast. Also would like to thank Dallas Vieris Corporation, who has been running this webcast as well. And thank all of you who have um, um, participated in this, and just to remind you that you can see it online. It will be posted in the next couple of days online, and uh, as a, a link will be sent uh, to you with the details. Okay, thank you very much once again.